Hi, my name is Janet Skinner. Sometimes in life we need a purpose to continue. And back in the early 1990s, I was looking for a reason to live, if you like. Um, just happened by accident one day that I saw that Bung Station, which is in Queensland, was going to be demolished and replaced. So I decided to paint it. And during the 1990s, I painted 104 railway scenes and that kept me going. As I sat on the platform and railway sidings, old people would come over and speak to me and tell me about life in the good old days. These were elderly people. It transpired that many of them were born in the early 1900s. I wrote down their names and phone numbers and I went back and interviewed them. There's a series of some 35 railway tapes that I'm making of the interviews that I recorded in New South Wales and Queensland. I'm not a journalist. I've got no background training in interviewing. And I really hope you enjoy these films. Um, I hope they bring laughter to many and insight into as what life used to be like. And please bear with me. I had fun doing them and I hope you have fun listening to them. Thank you so much. Oh no, during the war years, I joined, joined up with the first opportunity I had after, after I was available to go because the railways would have claimed me as a protective industry. So I put in and got into the uh, Air Force at a, a mobile uh, recruiting depot at Tamil that was uh, just do a certain time at Tamworth and take up all the different, different musterings required and they'd move to another township. So Tamworth is where I, I joined up from but it was some time later before I actually entered the Air Force and that but uh, I think I was actually working at Glen Innes Station when I received the information like that I was to join in Sydney at a certain date. Well, I did five and a half years. How did you it, feel? Was she excited about what you were going ahead to do or worried? Oh, or, yes. or Well, I was qualified to a certain extent uh, with Morse code with the railways. Well, then the opportunity uh, for advancement in the Air Force uh, turned up when I was at Richmond and I uh, put in for the, one of the positions there for Morse operator and learning radio uh, as well, right, the radio sets. This is it, when you work in the railway? When I, no, no. no, no, I learnt, learnt the railway yeah. for one year, mm -hmm. so I was proficient in sending or receiving Morse code and the railway sets. Yeah. Well then, I went into this at Richmond, you were working for the Air Force? In the right? Air Force at Richmond, just out of Sydney. Well, then I, I went into the uh, wireless operator course, which lasted about five months. That's if you went straight through. But it was that fairly stiff with not only just learning to do Morse code, sending and receiving up to 25 words a minute, which was fairly fast. Mm -hmm. And that's in code, five letter, five, mm. five letter code. Well, <clears throat> then after you, uh, you may happen to get a month or so behind. I had months when I was in Richmond. Right, well, that put me back another month. And a lot of it in radio is something you've got to visualise. 
you can't see what's going on inside a radio valve, which they're not using now, they're using transistors. You couldn't see what, what was going on. It was a theory that was going on in that valve when it's heated up and a, and a sound comes in, the signal comes in and it's amplified, etc. Like that's going to like just very minute, like just uh, minutely just what we had to do. But then we went from there, after about five months, we went to Point Cook and we did. Where was that? Point Cook was in just out of Melbourne, was the last RAAF station there. Well, we had to then go to advanced speed uh, classes. We felt we could go past 25 words a minute. Sometimes we'd have a, have a go at ourselves and see if we could. I remember a funny incident there with the railways and the post office. All the uh, Morse members click, 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 click. Like with the, you're, you're just picking the time that the dashes and dots were heard with this clacking, clicking all the time. With the with the uh, with the air force, it was uh, more what a sound they called bzz, 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 like da 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 da. Right, you're getting like that, like you might hear an overseas short wave, and you hear it rattling away. Well, that is going too fast. For you to read, that was done with a machine. And they just speed it up, send it through about twice the speed that you could possibly read it. Or they speed it up. So then we had to do it, do our tests and that, with in an aircraft. Then we had to finally pass our exams uh, with theory and practical in an aircraft. Did you go up in the aircraft or did you go on the ground? Oh, in the aircraft. We're flying mm -hmm. and we were actually... What, what sort of planes did you get? Yeah, back to tours, are we? Back no, in the we're, we're talking about the types the of The Air Force planes. and that went to... Then went with what they no, call... No, we're just talking about the planes that you went in. The Air, Air Force, we were sending the Spitfire Squadron, three squadrons of Spitfires to the defence of Darwin and the North. Well, they of course had to have ground staff as well because the Spitfires were one man, one pilot, voice only. There was no Morse code used with them, but that was used with the ground and getting, say, weather reports or all this type of thing. Well, I was with one of the Spitfire squadrons, which was an Australian squadron, and the First, Were we allowed to say on here what squadron it was, or um... wouldn't worry? Or well, 452 Spitfire Squadron. Yeah. Uh, there were three. There was one English squadron, which was at the R the RAF uh, aerodrome at Darwin, and the other two were positioned just off the main road, north of the south road going south from Darwin. Well. The person there became the first big raid. Now, the commanding officer of that squadron was seen chasing a zero out, out to sea. We never heard any more of that commanding officer. And then a fellow named uh, squadron leader or acting wing commander, uh, uh, Dilla Caldwell, which had flown in London in the Battle of Britain as well. He had to take over charge of that squadron. But then, did you ever get? Excuse me. Did you ever get to fly in a Spitfire? Or? Oh no, no. no it's not a passenger. It's no. a one pilot. Yeah. Oh right. One pilot. Right. And that, okay. But that, uh, Show my ignorance now, no. But, <laughs> oh no. The uh, mm. that was. But where I was with the squadron for a short period, then they, uh, as a corporal, then they called me to the. Uh, headquarters for the control of the Spitfires, which uh, we had three three uh, radio points, and uh, the direction from the from the Spitfires were from those points. They could all intersect, and the operations officer could say, "Right, the Spitfires are in a certain position. The enemy was proceeding from." 
uh, bombers from Darwin down towards uh, the the American heavy bombers down at Fenton. Well, uh, that was their target, their main target. But where I was with the uh, with the station then was with the uh, for the control of the Spitfires. We had the uh, what they call the Whispering Death, which was the bow fighters on just over the hill on one side of us. We had down uh, the Dutch Dutchmen flying Beaufort bombers for looking for submarine uh, yeah. activity. Can you spell Beaufort? B O E F O R T. B E A U. B E A U. B E A U. That was a Dutch squadron for, were flying those on anti uh, anti submarine warfare. So, uh, and then just next to us on the main road was a medical receiving station, and which was staffed with a lot of the nurses, like were females there. And this is actually in Darwin, isn't it? This is south of Darwin on the main road. And was you there when the bombing went? When there was bombing oh, in Darwin? Ma many raids, many raids. Right. Not the first main one, though. Not the first one where they hit the harbour. Mm -hmm. The harbour, you just see ships on their side with a red light on them. That's all that they didn't ship them. Was it frightening to be there when it was being bombed in the Oh, when the bombing, you could tell in the bombing when they dropped the bombs because it's like a, a like a wind, a swishing sound, like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Right, you're just waiting for them to waiting for them to land and that will, where we were camped, there were unexploded bombs either side of our roadway coming out. Well, well they had to be removed, of course. Was you in a tent all this time or? The tenting. Right, so yep. a great big field with hundreds of tents. Hmm? Big field with hundreds of tents, lots and lots of tents. Oh yes, there'd be, like there'd be, say, 50 odd tents. Green, but there's one little unit. Were they green tents or what were they? Yeah, like, like, uh, like the yeah. camouflage. Yeah. And how did you get on in the heat up there? And, I mean... I didn't mind the heat one little bit. And what was the In the wet season, yeah. you sweated and were wet nearly all the time. The dry season was lovely and clear. The might be like today. There's not a cloud in the sky week after week after week. And what about food and that sort of thing, fresh milk, meat, that type of thing? Do well, you remember back then? A lot of the milk would be made up, would be made up stuff, I presume. Mm. Potatoes were mainly powdered, powdered made up, powdered potato. And uh, meat, was, meat was quite reasonable. But I remember one instant later I became sergeant and I then you ate in a different uh, mess, a sergeant's mess. And we were intrigued one day, we thought, I wonder what we're eating. So they were like meat, meatballs. But when we found one complete bean hadn't been mashed, we found they were, they were uh, baked bean patties. Really? <laughs> and where was you? Where would you eat your dinners? In a big tent or in a room? Oh no, in a, in like a shed, like an open type of shed, right. uh, like iron roof, but just a large, uh, like open to the weather to a certain extent. They weren't like closed into like a complete house. Right. And when the war finished, you went back to the railway, did you? Went yes, I. I applied to go to the country, back to the country area where I was used to, but uh, no positions available then uh, for what I was like, uh, what my qualifications were, because I had left as a junior. Now I was now I was say, like 25, and uh, and married, so they they said no, there's no country position, so we had to do the two weeks. Refresh, of course, like to go back to the railways, and then I went to in the Sydney Sydney area from there then until I retired then in 1980. 